Good morning and welcome. I'm Peter Beinart, a non-resident fellow with the Foundation for Middle East Peace. On behalf of the Foundation, I am very pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, looking at surveillance and the fight against the coronavirus in Israel and around the world. To shed light on this topic, we have with us today three experts. First, we have Sharon Abraham Weiss, the Executive Director of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. She represented ACRI in landmark cases such as the Family Unification petition, the Guaranteed Minimal Income Dignified Existence petition, and the Lands Distribution petition. Second, we have Marwa Fatafta, who leads Access Now's work on digital rights in the Middle East and North African region as the MENA policy manager. Access Now's mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk around the globe. Uh, Marwa is also a policy analyst at Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Third, we have uh, Nadim Nashif, who is the executive director and co-founder of Hamla, the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media, where he is a digital rights expert and organizer. Prior to his role at Hamla, Nadim founded and served as director of Baladna, the Association for Arab Youth. Our webinar today will take the form of a discussion between the panelists and myself. In addition to my own questions, we are eager to take audience questions, which can be submitted via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the panel. I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A box and will do my best to factor as many as possible of your questions into the, into the discussion. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online immediately after it ends. Finally, if you have any technical problems with this webinar, please let us know using the chat function, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please don't use the chat function for questions as I may not see them. With that, we will begin. Um, so first, to, just to set the scene in Israel, uh, Nadim, uh, can you paint a picture of the surveillance programs the Israeli government has enacted under in the name of co combating COVID-19? And how does this connect to Israel's history of surveillance in the occupied territories? Yes, uh, Peter, uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Christine and the team of Foundation for, for Middle East Peace for uh, holding up this, uh, this panel, this important uh, talk. Um, so basically, uh, the, the dynamics that happened uh, since the beginning of this uh, health crisis was that there was a lot of uh, hints and speak around the geolocation of, of, uh, of people who are by the Israeli government sees them as second corona and wanted to find where they are and uh, mainly using obviously the, the, the mobile phones and through the mobile phones um, uh, trying to locate them and to locate with whom they interacted or they have been nearby certain people for certain time. At the beginning obviously it had lots of discussion around it also because the Israeli Knesset was not uh, functioning at the time and the committees were not there to oversee this process um, so basically, um, uh, it was regulated under the emergency laws and later on um, through the Shabak law. Um, and obviously, there were many petitions that happening in the process are, are still happening. And probably uh, Sharon from Acre will uh, speak much more about this aspect. Um, but from Israeli perspective, it was a, a new thing because it was basically a process that happening without uh, the oversight of, of certain uh, Knesset committees uh, that normally oversight this. And uh, mainly because it was the first time basically that Jewish Israelis uh, are being surveilled and this is, and people speak about this in a clear way. Um, and uh, there were like uh, discussions around what's the role of the Shabak, what's the role of the Ministry of Health, how much this inf flow of information between the Ministry of Health and the Shabak, would this information also be used, for example, by the police or? Uh, Nadim? Yes. Uh, I think you froze there for a second. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, and how much basically this information would be used for other issues by the, the police, for example? So lots of questions. Um, uh, for many of us um, uh, Palestinians, we are, we, we are very much used, obviously, uh, in the past uh, decades to have this uh, surveillance uh, uh, happening all the time and in different uh, ways. But I guess for Israeli public, uh, it was a, a, an issue that people started speaking about. 
Um, uh, later on, there was this announcement about the application of the Ministry of Health. So the Israeli Ministry of Health has a new application that's supposed to be a bit more progressive. And there were a few people who were advocating for it because this application um, is basically an application that is uh, on voluntary basis. It's not obligatory. If you wish, you can download it. Uh, and this application was developed by a group of developers who are not from the ministry itself, but outside of the ministry, and who develop it in an open uh, code source. So basically, other developers can see it. Uh, um, so obviously, it's more uh, transparent and uh, um, and much better than uh, um, uh, other ways of uh, knowing where the corona uh, virus uh, people are. And basically, the basic idea of this application that it will know that certain people are in certain areas, and if you came across another corona um, or a corona patient somewhere um, less than one meter for more than 15 minutes, the application will let you know, so you can go and check yourself. Um, um, so supposedly, I mean, generally, it looks much uh, more uh, uh, okay application or more progressive in a way. Um, but uh, there was a, a lot of discussion. I'm speaking now mainly about the Palestinian community, uh, the Palestinian citizens in Israel community, that uh, between different activists, some of the activists were uh, pushing for this um, application and calling the people to download it, and others were saying still, we have so much uh, experience of mistrust and being surveilled and being uh, used by the Israeli government and ministries that uh, we use still even such an application, we don't want to download it. So it was uh, something um, very interesting, especially happening in a time of crisis where people are in a kind of panic and uh, very much afraid of their health uh, and what's happening with them. Um, so um, these, uh, again, even for this application, there were questions how much the Ministry of Health will use this uh, where the information, who have the access to the information, will the police will be able to use them, uh, is there a time limit for uh, calculating or, or preserving this, uh, this information. Uh, so it, it was also an interesting uh, uh, discussion. The other main point in my opinion that I want to um, speak about is basically investigative report by Ronan Bergman. Uh, and uh, Ronen Bergman um, is a well-known uh, Israeli journalist that he spoke in his investigative report with another report about a reporter about um, uh, something that is called the tool. Um, so in the middle of the crisis, they exposed the tool. The tool is basically a huge database that the Israeli government started um, creating uh, after the, the start of the Second Intifada. And basically, it records all the communication and telecommunication uh, messages between phones, geolocation, messages. Um, um, it's a huge uh, um, uh, database. Um, something similar maybe to the NSA in the US um, uh, to give an idea. Um, and apparently there are, each telecommunication company uh, has a license and part of this license they have some uh, hidden part of the agreement or the license that speaks that they have to cooperate with the Shabak on this, the tool, the database, basically passing all the records and the information. The point is that normally we would think that the secret services are targeting certain people who they are defining as a uh, threat. But in this case, basically the tool was spying on everybody. Uh, everybody who's connecting to the Israeli mobile networks, Israeli ne internet, um, is basically recorded in a mass scale. Um, so basically, if you want to ask um, about uh, citizen uh, or uh, ex-citizens, uh, let's say, Nadim Nashif, what you, have you been doing in the 19th of November 2010 uh, at uh, 11 in the morning, the tool, you question the tool, and the tool basically will give you this reply and this information. So uh, it's a huge uh, violation of uh, uh, of privacy of the people. And uh, here we are speaking about uh, a database that is also for Jewish Israelis and also for Palestinians. Basically everybody and for Palestinians in the West Bank who are connected to the Israeli network. So basically if you're a Palestinian in the West Bank and you have a Cellcom, let's say, which is an Israeli cellular company, you're also part of this deal. Um, now speaking more specifically about um, 
Yeah, and another, Nadim, I want to make sure we have time for the other guests. So maybe yeah. you can just wrap this part up and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. Last point is to say is basically that this is something that um, regarding Israeli citizens, when it comes to the West Bank, uh, to the Palestinian citizens of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza, we have to keep in mind um, that all the infrastructure of the Palestinian telecommunication is totally still controlled by the Israeli government. So basically the internet and the telecommunication all pass through Israel and then it reached the Palestinian uh, companies and then the Palestinian citizens. Um, so in a way it's also kind of regulated uh, since many years, but maybe later on we can expand on this. That sounds great. Um, Sharon, um, so what are ACRI's concerns about the current Israeli surveillance programs during this period of, of, of COVID-19? What are the legal challenges that you've launched and how has the Israeli government responded? Sharon, uh, I think you're. I think you're muted. Good evening from uh, Tel Aviv. Hi. Um, we're worried about a couple of things. First, I want to uh, lay the infrastructure of the uh, legal framework in Israel. So uh, the emergency uh, situation is is the default in Israel since 1948. Um, on the legal basis, it means that in any time they can be, they can be there can be emergency regulations. So if you look around the world in the COVID-19, some I think it's about 17 countries around the world declared uh, during the COVID-19 uh, period um, uh, regulation, emergency regulations. In Israel, it's the default. This is all the time. So we don't need to declare. It's there all the time, okay? Now it's important because it means that the the government, and here if we're speaking about democracy in the 1948 borders, the government can legislate without the parliament, without the Knesset. And this is exactly what happened here vis-a-vis uh, -vis the surveillance on the first night of the closure. So uh, the government legislated regulation, regulations, emergency regulations that allows the Shin Bet, the uh, security services of Israel, to follow everybody in Israel, um, which is really, I mean, in terms of legal framework, it's really important to understand. And it happened basically in the middle of the night with a government decision with no uh, checks and balances. And this was our first concern. I mean, how can, how can it happen in regulation, in emergency regulations? I have to say that ACRI was concerned before the COVID-19 about the uh, regulations, the emergency regulations. And in 1999, okay, 20, more than 20 years ago, we took it to court and we challenged the whole framework saying how come Israel is in a constant emergency uh, case. We got a verdict 13 years later in tw 2012, okay, it was pending for 13 years in Supreme Court saying that really it shouldn't be like this and it was minimized, minimized, but not enough. How do we know that not enough? Look what happened just three weeks ago when the, um, the government allowed in emergency regulations, the Shin Bet, to follow us. We submitted a, a petition to Supreme Court against it and later on it was changed and it was by legislation, not by those regulations, it was changed to legislation. We still, we amended the petition and uh, just yesterday, there was a hearing in the uh, Supreme Court uh, that took seven hours. And it was the first time in the history of the uh, Supreme Court of Israel that it was all live streaming. Now, look at the irony, okay? We're speaking here about transparency in uh, uh, access to court, but it's, it's about the uh, surveillance. And uh, we, we're very concerned because it's the first time that the Shin Bet, the security services, are using its tools, as, as far as we know, as, as first time is known, for something civil. And we were thinking, we, the, the petition uh, that is argued by our chief legal advisor, Dania Kier, is arguing that um, this shouldn't be allowed to use as civil tools at all. There should be any other ways, as uh, Nadim was describing, the shield, an application that is a civil one. I don't know any other means should be uh, should be examined before using secret services to spy 
on everybody here. Now, the authority specific that was given to the Shin Bet is um, as far as a person was identified as a COVID-19 patient, his phone was traced for the past 14 days and people that were in touch with him in the past 14 days for more than 15 uh, minutes and two meters uh, would be immediately get a message on their cell phone that they are quarantined. So it's very major. I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's a big thing. Now imagine I'm sitting here with the library, but my neighbor is, uh, is, is behind. And maybe we have two meters between us for more than two hours. So if, if, her, if my neighbor is, uh, God forbid, sick, am I going to be quarantined as well? What are the checks and balances? What does it mean? Uh, and that's beyond the, the power that is given to one authority with not enough checks and balances. And on an authority that was designated to security issues that now has vast powers to do it in a different way. Thank you. Um, uh, Marwa, uh, Israel's use of surveillance uh, obviously isn't new and, and it's not unique to Israel either, but Israel's public disclosure and open deba debate about the use of mass surveillance seems novel. How do you see this public unveiling of mass surveillance and does it concern you or is it a positive development? Certainly, anything but positive. Uh, hello, everyone from Berlin. Uh, it's my pleasure also to join uh, this webinar. Um, like what Nadim uh, uh, mentioned and Sharon, um, Israel is well known for its surveillance capabilities. And uh, those, of, those of us who are working on digital rights in, in, in Palestine or in the occupied Palestinian territories, know very well how uh, pervasive and intrusive um, Israel's mass surveillance of Palestinians uh, from uh, controlling the infrastructure itself to monitoring uh, social media to hacking phones. Um, what is novel about the situation indeed as already discussed is um, is that the Israeli government is using or deploying these tools on its own population which of course there's a lot of controversy and public outcry um, and clearly Israel is not alone in, in rushing into digital surveillance as a response to fight the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and using tracking apps or geolocation uh, tracking. Um, many governments around the world has done the same or contemplating following similar steps. Uh, also corporations are, are developing tools or apps um, that follow the same logic. Um, and I think we will continue also to see uh, more of these tech solutions uh, coming from both governments and corporations. And of course, this is uh, extremely worrying and dangerous because this emergency is being used to, um, as an excuse for, for deploying mass surveillance and it's laying the ground uh, for such a surveillance structure to take place. Uh, and it has obviously direct uh, threat and uh, violates our privacy as people. Um, it's done with very little transparency. There's lots of question marks about, you know, which agencies have access to people's data? How are they being uh, stored and for how long as well? I mean, in the Israeli case, as mentioned, I mean, it's the Shin Bet or the um, intelligence, uh, security intelligence services and agencies uh, are in charge of of that part of managing the crisis. And these agencies have, in general, they, they operate in secrecy, they have very little oversight, uh, there's little accountability. And so even you as a citizen, when your privacy is violated or there are uh, abuses in the future, how can you address this and how can you seek redress? Um, and how do you know which data is being gathered about you? I mean, there's lots of, as I said, like lots of question marks about what does it mean these tools and uh, in, in terms of our basic rights to, to privacy, to freedom of expression, uh, to association, to the right to association. Um, and, and that is indeed a, a very worrying uh, global trend. Thank you. Um, uh, Nadim, let's go back to you to look more specifically at the, the West Bank in Gaza. Um, uh, has Israel imp implemented any new surveillance programs that we know about in the West Bank and Gaza um, in the name of fighting COVID-19. Um, uh, and um, uh, 
have there been any changes in, in Israeli surveillance in the occupied territory since this virus broke out? Uh, Nadim, I think you're muted. You just need to unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think when we speak about Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, we, we also have to go a little bit back and see and understand like what kind of different surveillances that are happening. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, all the Palestinian uh, infrastructure of uh, ICT sector is basically controlled uh, since 1967 by the Israeli government. And by Oslo agreements, there was supposed to be gradually within the year of the agreement that this sector would be independent from the Israeli system. But obviously, as, as the Palestinian go to the direction of an uh, independent state, but obviously there was no independent state and no uh, uh, independent Palestinian infrastructure of uh, ICT. Um, now, if, if before uh, we had also the issues of uh, phone uh, monitoring of Palestinians, later on, uh, I mean, Palestinians basically suffer from all kinds of uh, surveillance uh, during the past decades, including um, the phones that, uh, in, the, in the previous years, but also there are uh, lots of things that are happening in the past years, including uh, having a magnetic uh, card if you want to get permit, because as you know, Palestinians cannot move from one area to another with having without having permit from the Israeli army. And then when you have this magnetic card, obviously they will photograph you. And this come uh, into the checkpoints and you being recorded at the checkpoints. And this come also with the issue of facial recognition that lately was discovered that many areas, uh, including the area C in the West Bank, uh, have these kind of facial recognition cameras. Um, and then there is lots of social media uh, monitor through algorithms. And uh, we know that basically there is a monitoring of all the Palestinian social media accounts. And then we also know that Israeli government have been using in the past predictive policing uh, 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 policies. Um, so adding all of these together, uh, right now the new thing is basically um, that the COGAT, which is uh, basically the civil administration of the Israeli army in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, um, is re released an application, an app that is calling the Palestinian basically citizens who need some kind of services from the COGAT, which is basically if you need a permit uh, to move from one area to other, you have to go there and apply. Now, obviously, the offices are closed because of the situation. So what they are suggesting to the, citizens, the Palestinian citizens basically to download this application um, and to try to have the services that they need through the application, which, which sounds like a, maybe logical from one hand if you don't know the reality, but obviously it means basically that you would download a small spy on your phone, mobile phone, somebody that would take different, uh, uh, um, uh, different information from your side something that is, uh, again, will uh, uh, violate your privacy and your uh, digital rights, um, not having somebody with you all the time and somebody who's listening to you, uh, especially that we are talking about case of uh, uh, occupation. It's not even a government citizen relationship. It's an occupation re reality. And obviously, uh, the Israeli army should not uh, be doing this and should find the ways um, to give these services all, as long as they are there, the occupying uh, power and the uh, one who should be Control. But I think this also gives us a great picture about how um, the Israeli government, the Israeli security sector, the Israeli tech companies are also using West Bank and Gaza in many aspects as a kind of a small or a big lab to test different uh, technologies. Because we also know that these technologies later on being sold to different other countries by different companies like NSO and other companies. Um, that are uh, infamous because of their uh, activities in different other countries. So it's not also Israeli-Palestinian problem. This is something that starts here, but ends somewhere else uh, with lots of uh, issues and problems. Um, great. Actually, that goes right into the question I wanted to ask you, Marwa, and then we'll come back to Sharon. Um, uh, Israel is known to be an exporter of surveillance technologies, particularly by private Israeli companies staffed by former Israeli military personnel who dealt with surveillance in the occupied territories. I wonder if you can unpack this phenomenon a bit for us. Who are some of these groups? What role are they playing in Israel and, uh, and particularly around the globe? And what kind of criticism do they face? Sure. I think um, what's happening in Israel, and then Nadim 
uh, briefly touched on that. There's a certain military industrial complex happening where those who are serving in the Israeli military intelligence, uh, for example, the, the elite unit, the A200 unit, or people who have been working in the, in the IDF, those after leaving, um, they go into a uh, private sector. Um, and of course, Israel prides itself in being a tech nation and they set up um, these companies that of course sell tech solutions to the world um, uh, based on the, the tools and the knowledge and the experience they've gained while serving in the military intelligence or in the army. And maybe Sharon could elaborate on that, but there is no legal uh, barrier or framework that uh, kind of stops this revolving door, meaning the people who serve in government uh, or in the, in the security um, agencies from leaving what they have learned or not using the tools that they have learned to then later um, open or start private I mean, companies uh, and use again like these um this knowledge and these uh, this exp expertise to gain profit and obviously the the most um infamous uh company is the nso group which was set up by people who had served um in in the military intelligence before and um the nso group uh, it's it's been uh, implicated in so many scandals recently i mean one of them is uh, through its Pegasus uh, spyware, uh, which basically turns your phone into a, 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 a spy phone. They can know where you've been, the people you're talking to, they can operate your microphone, your camera. Um, and uh, according to Citizen Lab, which is, um, which is a project uh, uh, that investigated the, the spyware uh, based in Canada, uh, they found that, for example, it's been used by the UAE to uh, spy on the human rights defender Ahmad Mansour, which of course ended up in jail. Uh, the same spyware has been used in the murder of the Saudi journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and uh, WhatsApp, then the latest, had uh, sued uh, the NSO group because it's been found that uh, they have also developed a spyware that targeted over. I think 1,400 individuals, including 100 uh, civil society activists and journalists, and this spying has led to the torture and the arrest, or sometimes, in some cases, the extrajudicial killing of. Uh, yeah, um, what I was saying is that, for example, the NSO, uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19, rushed to announce that, you know, it's ready and willing to provide its technology for governments around the world to help contain and, and fight the, the pandemic. And obviously, I think governments should be extremely cautious uh, before they cooperate with, with companies like these that have a tarnished human rights record. Um, another example is an Israeli company called uh, AnyVision, and recently it has been in the news uh, as Microsoft decided to divest from investment. AnyVision is a um, facial recognition uh, biometric company, and they have installed, for example, some facial recognition tools at Israeli checkpoints in the West Bank. Um, and these, they have a very close working relationship with the, the, the defense ministry. Um, but of course, they are um, denying any, um, any involvement in monitoring Palestinians. And uh, I think in one of their, their media interviews, one of their former employees said that, uh, you know, they pride in themselves in the fact that they are operating in the West Bank in the most difficult security environment. And then later on, they are exporting these technologies to airports and uh, as security uh, solutions or security technologies. And so, you know, there have been attempts uh, recently, for example, Amnesty International has asked the, the Israeli Ministry of Def Defense to revoke the license, export license of the NSO group, which um, has, has been denied to my knowledge. And so it seems to me it, everybody's, it's a win-win situation for both the government and these private companies to, to operate and benefit without any, without any accountability. Um, 
And uh, it's also well known that Israel is a major player in exporting surveillance technologies. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, for, on freedom of expression, David Kai, he, when he asked last year for an immediate moratorium on the sale and export and use of surveillance technologies until uh, there is a, um, a clear human rights-based regulation uh, for this, uh, for this uh, expansion and, and spread of these technologies, spyware technologies. And he cited the NSA group as, as a clear example of how um, lack of regulation, uh, both at a global level as, as well as on national level, can lead to these technologies being sold and people's rights being targeted without any, as I said, without any accountability. Thanks, um, Sharon. Um, so just to go back to what's happening inside Israel itself, um, um, uh, since these surveillance powers were enacted under emergency orders, should we hope or assume that once the threat of COVID-19 is contained, that the surveillance programs will end? Have there been any, any promises um, in that regard? Uh, what kind of oversight is there to ensure that, um, that they would end when this particular public health threat ends? On the contrary, what we actually is going to see that it's going to be used more and more. Currently, this regulation uh, is supposed to expire on uh, April 30th, but as Chief Justice Hayub said it yesterday on the hearing, I don't see the end of it. So basically, most of us at this stage in Israel are in kind of um, um, closure. It's not a full quarantine, but we have a lot of limitation on our, um, uh, on our freedom of movement. And it makes sense. I mean, uh, I didn't say it in the beginning. I mean, these are uh, very crucial questions. I mean, the right to life, this, uh, we are not underestimating the COVID-19 at all. I mean, it's a serious issue and obviously uh, it's a different time. But at the same, our argument is at the same time that we agree, understand, fully understand and hope that the world would be able to control the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we, we, we hope that at the same time we won't give up on our, on our rights as democracies. And Israel is a fragile democracy, as I explained in the beginning, the fact that there is a default of re emergency uh, state. But what we are seeing here, that now we're sitting at home, slowly, slowly, hopefully there will be reliefs. And as soon as there are gonna be reliefs, it will be more important uh, to follow you to some extent. And uh, now it doesn't mean a, a lot because we, we're not moving much. What does it mean when we're going outside? Now, it's not only about, I, I was speaking about the security services, she embed and their authorities, but at the same re regulations, there, there is an authority to every police officer to trace my phone calls and my, my phone moving. So every police officer, and this is important to understand, every police officer can call my mobile company and get and track my movement in the um, in the past days. So this is really it's a vast authorities to the state. Speaking about democracy, you want to have separation of powers. You want to have supervision on this. How it's happening? What is happening? What are the numbers? And we are not seeing the end of it at all. I mean, I, I don't know how much how longer COVID nineteen is going to be uh, with us. And um, I'm wondering how is it possible to climb down the ladder? You're giving a lot of authorities now. With, we think it's too wide. On one day you're saying, okay, enough, you don't get these authorities anymore. It's, it sounds like a fairy tale, disappear. I mean, this is something that needs to be taken step by step with checking all the other's alternatives. And this is our claim. Not that there is no need to know what people are doing and there should be some restrictions. We do understand it. But at the same time, all the alternative should be measured before giving so strong and vast authorities uh, to one um, uh, to the security services in Israel, especially when it's civil uh, civil matters. Uh, Nadim, um, picking up on the comments that Mara was making about uh, groups like Any Vision. Um, um, NSO. What else do we need to know about how the groups like these are operating in Israel and the occupied territories? 
Yeah, so, so, so basically going back that there are uh, several groups uh, and uh, companies who, who are working and there's a very close tie as uh, also Marwa spoke before between uh, the security establishment and the private sector. Lots of the things that are happening are connected either by um, people who finish their service and then they join or create these companies um, or being recruited by the companies themselves. Uh, one of the uh, examples also is that uh, uh, Bennett, the Israeli Minister of Defense, is uh, now working together with NSO on, on an application that's supposed to help uh, to get control of the pandemic. Um, so this is something that is, is, is happening all the time. And for many of the Palestinians, again, it's uh, the big brother reality is, is very clear reality that have been even before. Uh, the pandemic and um, you are being watched everywhere basically um, we're not talking only about facial recognition cameras that are out there on the checkpoints we are talking about uh, deep uh, areas uh, sea areas we are talking about um, even using them in, in east jerusalem and different uh, villages in the west bank so you, you're being controlled 24 hours uh, either your mobile phone or by cameras or by checkpoints and everything is being uh, recorded and there is no privacy at all uh, anymore. So this is something that is, uh, is very alarming. I think going back also to the, what's happening inside the, um, the Israeli uh, uh, scene, uh, the Israeli government is also feeling very convenient right now to, to speak about things and to, to do things that maybe they would think twice before. I mean, even about the investigative piece, I'm going back to Ronan Bergman and what he published. As you know, in Israel, there is a military censorship and things need to go through the censorship. Um, and I would doubt if, if the government or the secret uh, services would not want him to publish it, that he, he cannot publish it. So publishing is, is also giving a message to the citizens and to the non-citizens that Israel is controlling, that the government know everything about you and we know where have you been, etc., etc. So this is something that is very alarming. And as Sharon saying, the question is like the time limit. It's clear, at least to me, that there is not a time limit to these things. And getting the legitimacy now and feeling that these things are very legitimate to do, this will accompany us to many uh, 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 years ago uh, ahead. Um, so if things were only about, uh, you know, about Palestinians and the West Bank and under like security excuses, uh, now, uh, I assume that basically what's happening, and if you read this investigative report, that everybody's being surveilled from the sea to the river. And this is the new reality that everybody's in. Um, uh, Marwa, what would you say to those people who say, well, look, the, 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 this emergency public health situation outweighs concerns about privacy, um, and there are extreme measures that need to be taken, or how does one find the kind of the right balance between legitimate public health responses um, and, um, and the rights of privacy? Yeah, I think the, the crisis, like crisis, like the current pandemic is, uh, evokes a lot of fear among people. And so governments often use that fear to justify uh, such extra ordinary measures that violates or abuses people's fundamental rights like their right to privacy for example and we talked before at length um, and so um, the it is like we are living through a global pandemic it is a global crisis that does require you know extraordinary me measures and like what Sharon mentioned um, this is not to say that technology is bad or I mean, technology could be helpful in the crisis, but there needs to be, first of all, looking at what are the different alternatives. Can, do we really need mass surveillance to fight this pandemic? And um, Access Now, together with, with uh, over 100 organizations, uh, we, we signed a joint statement asking governments not to use the COVID-19 crisis uh, as a cover to push for more mass, mass surveillance. Um, and there needs to be, of course, like very strict criteria when there is a need to use these measures. One of them is the time limit. There needs to be a clear uh, time ending to the use of these technologies. 
um, the scope of the data. So the scope of the data needs to be limited as well. Like which kind of data are you tracking? Are, are you uh, collecting? And who is collecting that government? Which part, or like which government agency? Where are they retaining this data and for how long? And can this data, for example, be used after the crisis is over? These are, you know, very clear, strict measures that need, need to be taken by governments who use tracking um, technologies or geolocation technologies, surveillance technologies in the framework of the, of the pandemic. Um, there needs to be a transparency as well. And in general, like as a general principle that these uh, solutions have to be proportionate. Now, it has come to a situation where in the public discourse of this, of this pandemic that, you know, there is some sort of hierarchy between your fund, like people's fundamental rights. So, it's a, either you, in order to save your life and uh, your health, then, then you have to sacrifice something else. In, in this case, your privacy. And when you feel you're being monitored, of course, then it, it affects your freedom. It affects your freedom of movement, your freedom of association, your freedom of expression. So um, uh, it's, uh, I think people shouldn't be pushed in a corner where they have to choose between their right to health, their right to life, and their right to privacy. And, um, and the, the, the trend looks like now is that uh, this mass surveillance infrastructure that is being deployed, when how is it going to be dismantled once the crisis is over, once the pandemic is over? Because it will be over. Um, and the question is, how do you escalate? Uh, and how do you escalate? And also, how do you ensure that such measures wouldn't be used in the future? I think this is a very important question. If this is, uh, if every time there's a crisis at such level or a different kind of crisis, we governments rush to use uh, mass surveillance. What does that tell us about government responses to, to crises that affect us as individuals and also affects our societies and, and impacts the way we live and impacts our fundamental rights? I mean, these are all big questions, obviously, that uh, uh, are, are scary, um, looking at how the world would look like post the, post the pandemic. Thanks. Um, we have a number of questions, so I'm gonna to try to get to some of them. Um, first one for, for you, Sharon. Um, the questioner asks about checks and balances. So where in the Israeli political system, is it the courts, uh, opposition political parties, other uh, elms, are there that kind of pushing back against the potential overreach of these emergency regulations? And how successful, how successfully functioning are those checks and balances right now? So uh, I'm speaking about Israel in the 1948 border as a democracy, of course. And um, I'm speaking, first of all, it's the parliament, okay? There's a committee of the parliament that should hear in the beginning, the decision to give the authority to the security services was by executive regulations, emergency regulations only, without any supervision. We are beyond, due to our petition together with Adala and, and uh, the journalists of Israel, we are beyond that. Now it's in the Knesset, our parliament, and th there is a committee that should hear, uh, should uh, relate to it, at this stage, it's actually, we are beyond, we are in the Supreme Court. As I said yesterday, it was, uh, was a long hearing. Um, I, my impression was it was a very serious hearing. I believe that during next week, we'll have a verdict about it. And in this case, we'll exhaust all our potential. And it's also uh, public pressure as well. I mean, there is a lot of co columns and journalists and other people that are writing about it, raising question mark, not to take it for granted. A lot of people are saying, okay, this is the right to life. What do you want? I mean, not that I want to underestimate the right to life, not at all, but always the question whether the right to life, especially in a pandemic like this, the, the um, COVID-19, do we allow everything? Do we say we forget our democracy and let's do everything to stop it? Or we are saying, okay, you know what? We're still a democracy. What does it mean? We raise question marks. We try to find alternatives. And this is the, the thing that really worries me at this stage. Uh, what is going to happen to democracy the day after? There are a lot of signs. I mean, here we're speaking about only about digital issues. We have a petition pending in Supreme Court about the, um, the authorities of our Minister of Justice that uh, decided to nearly freeze uh, all the hearings. 
maybe it should be minimized, but it was happening at the same way with the emergency regulations the night before of the hearing of our prime minister, who, who is being trialed now. So there are a lot of questions that are being um, held here. Uh, just uh, five minutes before I started this conversation, we got good news uh, that uh, there was uh, reg emergency regulations regarding protection of pregnant women in Israel. Why emergency re regulation by, uh, in the time of COVID-19? And we petitioned with other organizations to Supreme Court just like three days ago. And five minutes before we started this conversation, we got not a decision from court, but the government decided to uh, cancel these regulations. So these are checks and balances. The government knows that Supreme Court is about to look at it on Monday, the, schedule, the hearing is scheduled. So checks and balances is, is looking around being out there in the fresh air, in the sunlight, speaking about those things. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Nadim, I wanted to go to you with, a, we had a question um, which was uh, um, about the, the relationship of the, the Palestinian Authority in this, um, in this moment. Um, obviously the PA and Israel have a um, peculiar relationship, a kind of part antagonism, part uh, subcontractor kind of relationship. This, this questioner was asking about a particular article, I guess, that appeared in the Times of Israel, which suggested that, um, that, the, that some PA officials had accused Israel of spreading the coronavirus in the West Bank. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what has happened to the relationship between the PA and the Israeli government in the midst of this virus. Yeah, I, actually the Palestinian officials were not accusing the Israeli government uh, of spreading the, the virus. They were simply saying that there is a huge amount of Palestinian workers who work in Israel and live in Israel. And at that time, the, the numbers of people who had the corona in Israel was much higher, and still, by the way, much higher than the Palestinians in the West Bank. And they were saying that the source of, uh, of, of, of the virus in the West Bank is by these workers who, who move between the West Bank and Israel, basically. Um, uh, and I think they, they can prove it. So it was not something kind of uh, political uh, argumentation. It was it's, it's, it's basically a, a uh, Nadim, you still there? We've uh, we lost you for a sec for a second. Um, okay, Nadim is uh, just frozen, unfortunately, for a minute. So, uh, oh, Nadim, you're back. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I just was just saying that basically the Palestinian government found found ways to mitigate this issue and to find solution for these workers. Basically, uh, I think um, we've run into a problem again. Um, so Nadim, while we work on that, I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go to uh, to 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 Marwa. Um, we have a question um, about um, whether there are efforts underway to raise concerns with the private equity firms that finance surveillance technology companies like uh, NSO uh, and the public banks that provide financing. Um, are there any rules associated with that? Are there any activist uh, efforts regarding that? Uh, Marwa, you're, you're just, you're still muted. I do that all the time. Uh, I mean, on that specific point, I'm not aware of, of such activities. Uh, but lately, I mean, the, for example, the WhatsApp taking steps to, to sue uh, the NSO group is an unprecedented step in towards putting accountability to, to what these groups are, are doing or companies are doing. But in terms of um, putting pressure on, on equity firms, uh, I'm not aware of. Um, at Access Now, we, we advocate for um, regulating or having a, a, a comprehensive, a global human rights centered regulation for the use and the export um, and trade of these surveillance uh, technologies. Great. Uh, Nadim, I think you're, you're back. Uh, did you want to just pick up where you left off? You were talking about um, the relationship between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, the, the PA's concerns about Palestinian workers going back and forth from Israel proper into, into the West Bank, and uh, how did that play itself out? Yes, so basically at the beginning, the Israeli government wanted the workers to stay in Israel because of, you know, the, 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 the buildings and the different infrastructures that they wanted to be part of that. 
and later on decided to send them back to the to the West Bank. So there was this issue that these workers came like with the uh, with the virus, and then the virus starts spreading between their families, and they did ask them uh, to quarantine. So I don't think that they really were accusing Israel in a purpose like spreading the the virus as much as I know, and I tried to follow all the officials. Um, but I think beyond this, there is a strong cooperation, at least on the um, health aspect of it. So uh, health-wise, the, the health systems are uh, very much coordinated. I, I had some meetings with a person in the Palestinian Ministry of Health responsible on this aspect, and there was a strong cooperation as, as, a, as much as so between them and passing information and equipment. Um, we have a question about about Gaza. Uh, um, I'm just going to open it up to anybody who who feels like they they have something to say about the situation. But the question is, you know, given the isolation of Gaza with the the, the blockade, how is surveillance being used there, and and what do we know about the the, the dangers of um uh, of the of surveillance and of course of the virus itself in in Gaza? Anyone want to jump in on that? Um, Mau, I think I saw you saying something, but you're but you're muted. No, I was advocating for Nadim to take this question. Uh, okay, Nadim, do you wanna do you wanna? Yeah, I mean, not not specifically surveillance related to um, to COVID nineteen, but I think Gaza was heavily is heavily and still was and still heavily surveilled. We know about uh, testimonies from uh, veterans and soldiers who were in uh, Unit Eight Two Zero Zero. Uh, speaking about how they monitored the LGBT uh, person in Gaza and um, uh, having these kind of extortions, either you collaborate with us or not, uh, uh, we will let uh, uh, the Hamas authorities to know that you, you, you're gay and these kind of things that there, there were like uh, testimonies uh, around this. So we know that there's lots of heavy surveillance that's happening there. Um, and I think through international bodies regarding the COVID-19, through international bodies, um, because of the crisis, there is more and more uh, negotiation that's happening between Hamas and the Israeli government, actually. And there are more and more agreements, even about releasing prisoners and exchanging of uh, prisoners. There is something that is kind of being built up. I think in the coming weeks, probably we'll hear more about it. But uh, through international uh, mediators, uh, including Russia and Egypt, etc. Um, I think the atmosphere is allowing both sides maybe to do such a deal in the near future. Hmm. Can I I just... Just add... Please, go Sorry. If go I just ahead. may add something very quickly on, on surveillance in Gaza. I mean, it's not related to COVID-19, but um, things that happen, happened during the Israeli uh, wars on, on Gaza in 2014 and, and before. Uh, for example, texting families uh, or sending them warning on their mo phones before they uh, bomb the buildings. Uh, or I think a few years back or maybe two years ago, there was from Kogat this um, picture of a building asking families to clear the building before they're planning the, uh, to do an assassination or they're doing a military operation. And so that gives you a clear idea how much they know and how much surveillance there is in the Gaza Strip to know which families are living in which building and what are their phone numbers and that they're able to uh, directly text them uh, to give them warnings before they bomb. I mean, that's a clear indication how, of how heavily the population in Gaza are surveilled. And of course, during this pandemic, I don't think this would, there would be any um, exception. Nadim, I just want to go back to you because what you were saying was, I think, quite intriguing and I wanted you to elaborate if you could a little bit. You seem to be suggesting that the, the, the public health crisis was leading to some new kind of uh, rapprochement or interaction between Israel and Hamas um, that might have some political consequences, if I understood you correctly. I wonder if you could just ex explain that a little bit. Yes, I guess it's uh, for both uh, parties, it's, it's very stressful reality. I mean, if, if the COVID-19 will... Oh, uh oh, we're having some, uh, just some technical difficulties again. Um, Nadim, are you, uh, I think we've lost you again. Um, oh, well, uh, okay. Nadim, are you back? Yes. Okay, please. Um, so sorry for this uh, technical difficulties, but I was saying that basically the, the, it's a stressful reality for both uh, sides, I guess. 
Um, and if the COVID-19 will spread in Gaza, it would be catastrophic. I mean, it's, it's the most uh, populated area in a small area. And if it starts there, it would be responsibility uh, of both sides. Also, the Israeli government cannot ignore it. Um, so I think there are measures that being taken kind of talks and trying to uh, help at least in the level of having more equipment uh, passing uh, to Gaza through international agencies and having this kind of coordination. This is like on the health aspect. Uh, but I think also because of the crisis, they find it more convenient apparently to talk and to make maybe more uh, kind of settlements or to, come to, to, to withdraw certain requests that they had for before from the both sides party and to try to reach this agreement about the prisoners. I think there were several reports about it and several uh, international mediators who are part of this picture. And maybe it's easier also for Benjamin Netanyahu to pass such a, a decision in, in the time of the COVID-19. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, um, well, uh, uh, on behalf of FMEP, I wanted to thank all our participants, Sharon, Marwa, and Nadine. If you want to learn more about these issues we have been discussing, you can follow all of our panelists and their organizations. I encourage you to visit their websites and to find them on Twitter. And thanks to all who joined us for this webinar, and especially those who submitted questions. Check back at the FMEP website, www.fmep.org, for recording of this webinar, further resources on these topics, and for further announcements of additional webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.